Let's talk about it being surrounded. You have it discussed in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. But Luke 21 is a little different. It tells you about how it's going to be surrounded by nation or national armies. And then it draws back and it gives you a profile shot. I kind of like say coming in from the side. And there's a great deal concerning spiritual armies uh, indicated within this. And as much as all prophecies would be fulfilled within that brief period of time forementioned in Luke 21, which we'll cover in a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one has a habit sometimes of looking at news and where national armies are, and you forget about that that is from above. That is to say, Satan, his armies, and maybe most of all, God's armies. They, they protect us. We don't have anything to sweat. We got it made, okay? He's not going to let them touch one hair of your head. He said, touch not mine anointed, and you know something? He meant it. He means it very strongly. And therefore, you can count on that. It should give you pleasure. It should give you relief to know God loves you. He's, our Father doesn't look for someone to zap every day to slap somebody in line unless you happen to be in His service, and then He kind of will pull the reins on you a little bit every once in a while and say, Gee, haw. How many of you know what Gee, haw means, don't you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> And when he says G, you better G, and when he says haul, you better haul, okay? It's just, that's just the way he is. He expects obedience from his election, all right? Because he told Christ, you sit down at my right hand and you stay there, um, physically speaking, until your enemies are made your footstool. Well, then that kind of brings up a question. Who's going to make the enemy, the footstool. Well, he's got kind of people that kind of round things up and brings those things to pass, along with the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is in a sense to say the presence of Christ. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 21. And as I forestated, he begins in about the eighth verse saying, hey, take heed to yourself. There are a lot of preachers that are going to say, I'm a Christian preacher, come in my name, and they're going to deceive a lot of people. Why? They won't be teaching my word. That's Luke chapter 21. I'll get there in a moment with you. But he, he, that's the first warning out of his mouth. Don't let man deceive you. That means this man or any other man. Well, how do I know? Check them out in the Word of God. It's that simple. Listen, God's Word is true. That's the only truth there is in the world, basically, that you can always count on. So don't let man pull you away from that truth, because it is that truth that gives you your power, your destiny, and even your purpose. And when you drift away from that, what are you? Well, punch the clock and draw the check, and punch the clock and draw the check, year in, year out, you die, and that's it. Okay? Basically. There's a little more to it than that. But, but be a servant of God. Enjoy serving Him. Enjoy pleasing Him. Because when you please Him, He's going to bless you. And that blessing is a fantastic thing. Let's pick it up, if we may, with the 12th verse of Luke 21. Considering what is surrounding Jerusalem, you might think of it there today, as it is. What is surrounding it? It's real easy to see the physical part. But are we really up on the spiritual? Verse 12. And he goes about the same as you would read in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He, uh, and he says, but before that, before you see those armies actually surrounded, physical armies, verse 12, 
But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons being brought before kings and rulers. For what purpose? For my name's sake. Christianity, true Christianity. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. You see, you've got a purpose. If you're really in God's service, you have a destiny. That's important. Well, uh, I, I didn't know I was a great spokesman. You're not. I'm not. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks through us that is great. Okay? So always keep that in mind. Don't, don't let that blow your bubble up or he'll pop it for you. Okay? The witness will come from the Holy Spirit as he speaks through you. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, that's to say your mind, not to meditate before what you shall answer. Well, you wouldn't know what to say. I know what some of you would tell Satan. You'd start a big fight right there. Big argument. Yeah. But he's got some words for you, and what do they amount to? 15, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. I mean, even your adversaries, think about that. That might be some of your parents or folks that have delivered you up. The words you say, they can't contend with. Why? Well, it's not really you speaking. It's the Holy Spirit speaking for you. 16, and you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kin folks and Friends and um, and some of you shall be um, shall they cause to be put to death. Naturally, you're going to be delivered up before Satan, the false Messiah. What's his name? It's death. Okay. Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, two, verse fourteen will document that death is Satan's name. All right. That's why Christ came to this earth to destroy death, which is to say Satan. Verse 17, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Can you think of any other reason that would be greater to be, no one likes to be hated. But if you're going to be hated, what a great thing to be hated for is for Christ's sake. Because anybody that's against him, you wouldn't want anything to do with anyway, would you? I don't think so. Why? They're not of us. They went out from us. But we serve God. And um, so, uh, therefore, for his name's sake, you can take a lot of persecution. Why? Because it saves people. A little bit of it's going to stick when you teach truth. And sooner or later, it will uh, bring people around if, if they so choose, if they have a love of the Father. 17. You shall be hated for of all men from Isaiah 18, and there shall not a hair on your head perish. Now you've got to believe that, beloved. That's important. You're one of God's elect. Um, I could say there's not all that many, but there is a lot. But compared to the other numbers, there isn't. He, God takes care of his own. He says, Touch not mine anointed. And he meant it. God's elect are his anointed. They can't harm a hair on your head. Well, explain that to me then, some might say. Well, apparently you've never read in God's word where he beheld Satan as an angel, a star fall from heaven. And he gave you power over all your enemies. Now that means every living, last one of them, spiritual and or otherwise. You have power over them, use it. That's where most people get in trouble. They say, oh, I just got all to use it. I mean mean business. You don't have to put up with anything from the negative side of the spiritual force. Why? You have power in his name over all your adversaries, and that wisdom that he gives you will floor them. Will floor them. Both, I believe, now and later. 
Everything to its place, everything to its time. Our Father is so very good to his children. Okay, we'll go to the next verse. Um, in, verse 19. In your patience possess ye your souls. And that's an interesting verse. It's very short. But boy, how deep it is. In your patience possess ye your souls. But I just want it all right now, and I mean right now, and I'm not waiting, and I want now. I want action. Where's your patience? That's a good way to lose your soul, you know, to be able to say, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm serving you. You're not serving me. Patience, you know, men never have it. Some women do, okay? <laughs> it, it's a tough, uh, I'm just making points here, boys. Forgive me. But <laughs> it is true. Women do have more patience than anybody I believe I've ever seen. You know, a man will come in from work. Oh, Lord, it's been, it was a rough day. Had a rough trip. The poor little old woman has taken care of a batch of kids, canned, laundried, you know. And uh, I, does somebody need this? I didn't really have this planned, okay? <laughs> And you know, he sits down and plops down and says, bring me a Coke. You know, you know, and she brings him a Coke and she goes ahead and prepares supper. And she's going until bedtime. And he's sitting there, oh, I'm just wore out. You know, well, how, how does that happen? Then it can only be that God put the stronger souls in women, is all I can say. If us men had to go through the pain, they do. Ooh. You know, I don't know, I don't, it had been a short trip for a lot. That's a compliment to all you ladies. God bless you, okay? But women do have patience, they do. And men should try to have patience. What I'm saying is, let go and let God, you know, let, let God do his business and don't get in the way and be a help when you can. Well, how do I be a help? By knowing his word. That way you know what his plan is and you can kind of close up some of the loose ends as he leads you and guides you. And I mean do it right. Because you're skilled in his word. So in your patience, you possess your souls. Don't lose them. Hang on to them. It is your eternal self. Regardless of what body you're in, your soul is your self. Okay? So patience strengthens yourself, knowing that it's going to happen the way God wants it to anyway, regardless of how much you kick, scream, yell, or try to push. It's going to happen the way God wants it to, all right? Now, um, verse uh, 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Now what is the desolation of abomination? It's the Antichrist standing in Jerusalem where he ought not. So we're talking about spiritual armies here, okay? Let that settle into your mind. It's not the same as back in, uh, in uh, verse 9 where you hear wars and rumors of wars and blah, blah, blah. Okay? You have to account the spiritual in with this I don't know, what kind of a spiritual warrior are you? Do they scare you to death if they even show up? Some negative thought, do you not know how to handle it? Nip it in the bud. Okay. Put a stop to it. You're, you're a child of God, don't put up with junk. Okay. Let other people handle the junk. You're, you don't, you're too busy to do that. Okay. Take care of business. Let God be God and we'll take, so here we see the spiritual influence begin to move in. 21, then let them which are in the Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. It's not a very good place unless you have to go, all right? Many are going to be delivered up before the Spirit's Messiah. That's for sure. 
But um, you know when the spiritual aspects of the 13th chapter of Mark, the 24th chapter of Matthew, and this 21st chapter of Luke and many other places, when it begins to transpire, you must think both physically and spiritually, practicing that patience. Within that, you possess your soul, your credibility, how much God can count on you, and God likes a force, a strength, when one draws that strength from him. Don't ever forget that. 22, why we came here. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. I mean, that's the end. And do you know something? If it's written, you can count on it. It's going to come to pass is not only going to come to pass, it's going to come to pass exactly as it's written. The question is, have you read it? Are you familiar with it? Then that's why we all continue to study. Nobody knows 100% of God's Word. That's why we must refresh, refresh, refresh. And He recognizes that fact that you enjoy study, and He blesses you with knowledge, wisdom, and even patience to know that he's in charge, he's in control. I trust him. I hope you do. He knows what he's doing. Sometimes we don't, okay? Totally. But he knows totally what he is doing. And he's bringing it all to this place right here where that all things shall be fulfilled at that time. Many of you are familiar with the day of vengeance because it was the time and back in, I believe it was Luke 4, that Jesus went into a synagogue and he picked up the scroll of Isaiah and he read the first half of the sentence for salvation, but he dropped the last half, meaning the day of vengeance. Why? It wasn't time, but it is about time now. And vengeance belong us to the Lord, not us. Vengeance belong us to Him. We only serve and be ready and able to do what it is He would request us to do. One of the better times that He speaks of the spiritual as it connects with both the physical that is there, we find in, in the next of the last book of the Old Testament called Zechariah. Let's turn there, next to the last book in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 11. And the entire chapter basically speaks of God's will to the prophet concerning this particular time when God is going to say, hey, I've had it. This is it. It's going to be fulfilled. So, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 1, and it reads, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Now, the cedars of Lebanon have kind of always been um, representative of our people. So, we see that it doesn't matter. When God gets ready to put his foot down, it's going to happen. Verse 2, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 2. How fir trees... For the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan. Bashan was known for big everything, okay? Fertile. For the forest of the vintage is come down. And of course, I want you to call on your memory of um, the cedar, plain old box cedar, which is T. Asher, which is symbolic of Satan, all right? You'll find that in Isaiah 31. It's a totally different study for a different time. But it means Satan always wanted to be a big cedar of Lebanon. And he, he was just a little old, little old river bank cedar. Didn't amount to a hill of beans. You couldn't make nothing out of it. But he pictured himself big. He said, it's fallen. It's getting ready to. Why all scriptures are going to come to pass. Verse 3. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds. Now, are we talking about good shepherds or bad shepherds? 
Well, good shepherds don't howl all that much. They just hit the point and make the mark, and that's it. So these are fakes, okay? It means shepherds, leaders of nations, would-be uh, senatorial candidate type people, or uh, ones that like to block and hold up everything that's good and going for us or anything. He said, they're just doing a lot of howling. Don't amount to a hill of beans, but they're sure howling. For their glory is spoiled. A voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. You know what the Jordan is, don't you? That's a river. And what, what is along a river bank ever so often? It's thickets, it's brush. And there are lions that's laying out in that brush and those thickets ready to grab something that comes for a drink of water. What God is saying, it's not going to be safe at this time if you're not with me. Well, where does it say if you're not with me? Well, that, that goes without being said because of his promises. That is a child of God. You're supposed to know your father loves you. And he's not, you're not going to be deceived. You know, a wise person, if you know there is a real thicket there, and you know that it's real easy for a lion to grab prey that comes from water or weak or whatever. Uh, are you going there? Shoot, no. You know better. Don't go in the bushes, okay? Unless, unless you're well healed, okay? You just don't go there. You're smarter than that. But... Sometimes people are spoiled and they'll do the same stupid thing over and over and over. Just get chewed all up because they don't listen to the Father. They don't trust Him. He gave you a mind. You're supposed to use it. Verse 4, Thus saith the Lord my God, Feed the flock of the uh, slaughter. Feed those that are destined for slaughter on their present way. Give them a little truth occasionally. But at the same time, he kind of says it in irony, my friend. When that time comes, he's kind of fed up. Listen to this, verse 5. Whose possessors slay them. I don't know who possesses you. I hope your answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope it's not some fake teacher. I hope it's not the devil that possesses you. I hope that your mind is in gear and that Jesus Christ possesses you. Whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty, and they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. In other words, back to the very beginning of Luke 21, he said, hey, there's a lot of people going to come to you in the name of Christ saying they're a shepherd. Don't let them suck you in. Don't let them deceive you. Well, how do you know? Whether they teach God's word or not. It's that simple. So you do not allow someone to possess you to the point of selling you, and the way you stay clear of that is to see you're never deceived. Now, basically, what this is leading up to is the Kenites. Okay, they use trickery, usury. They'll use everything in the book to en encompass you and control you like a like a slave. And unfortunately, in usury, sometimes you can be, and you don't even realize it. In other words, if you work all your life to pay for a house that only should cost $10,000, but you pay 100000 interest, do you know where the interest went to? Usury. Okay, which God said, stay out of it as best you can. Anyway, they will sell you and say, I don't have to have any guilt because their own shepherds say, praise God. This, of course, has to do with the apostasy the falling away, where people are going to say, you don't have to worry. God loves you. You're going to fly away. You don't have to get involved in things of this world. We're going to fly away. Well, if God trained you 
and brought you up to be a spiritual warrior, a Christian warrior. I'm not talking about physical now, but to stand the gap, to repair the hedge, to keep Satan out. What do you find for? Okay. Where are you going? We got work here. Christ is coming here to do a work. Okay. This is why it's written in Ezekiel chapter 13. God said, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. He's, he's got purpose. And, um, and certainly he wants you as a part of that. They'll sell you. And they won't feel any guilt for it. Who are we talking about? Okay, um, verse 6. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord, but lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king, and they shall smite the land, and out of their hand I will not deliver them. Well, that, that sounds terrible that God's going to turn his back on us. No, that isn't what he said. It's those that are so ignorant that they don't know that God will protect them, that they can't bother a hair on your head. And if you allow the others to sell you, mislead you, mistreat you, then, hey, you deserve it. You had God's Word all the time to strengthen yourself, to be somebody. So, therefore... God says, the time of teaching, I'm kind of cooling it here, okay? And if you want to let them do that to you, hey, have a good day, okay? Now, well, I didn't know God talked like that. He just said it. He just said it. He said, I'm going to turn them over. Well, somebody would say, well, he said himself he was going to turn you over to your neighbor. Not if you're smarter than he is, you know? I, my neighbor, I guarantee you, he and I have a Christian association that I wouldn't mind putting myself in his hands anyway. It's the people that don't know any better. It's the people that don't care, that are not familiar with God's Word. God's just going to let them uh, do whatever they want to do. It's their choice. You're smarter than that. You're going to do it God's way, and God is going to bless you. He teaches you, and uh, uh, so it is. Uh, okay, um, verse, um, let's go with verse, did we get five? Whose possessors uh, slay them, we got that six. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord, but lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand. There, we got that one, didn't we? Okay. Verse 7, listen carefully, this identifies. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. I want you to underline the statement, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. The word poor of the flock should be translated from the Hebrew. You're, you with companion Bibles, it will instruct you on this. Uh, it should be read as one or two, rather than two as the Septuagint. It should be the sheep traffickers. The subject was selling the sheep. Okay. Now this is strictly all and out. In the 14th chapter of this great book of um, of. Uh, of uh, Zechariah, it the same word is translated Canaanites. Properly translated, it should be Kenites. Okay. It means those that sell the flocks that I'm going to feed you too. And God will. God is always fair. He'll give you what you got coming to you all at one time on this day. And that's going to be a great day. He said, I will feed them, and I'm also going to feed the sheep traffickers, those that sell my children, those that try to make usury out of them, those that mislead them, those that teach them falsely. 
He said, I'll take care of them. I'm going to do it. And certainly, indeed, he shall. The, again, all you have to do is a little bit of study on that, and you'll understand poor of the flock. Boy, what, a, what poor of the flock, you would usually think that was the poor ones that were really trying to serve him. And you really miss it there, because it's talking about the sheep traffickers carrying over from the other verse, those that sell my children. Okay? What about this staff? Well, a shepherd had two objects. He had a staff and a club. Okay? The staff was to defend the sheep, to reach out, take the crook, you grab them there by the leg, catch them and take care of their ills or whatever. And guess what the club was for? It was to beat the living daylights out of anybody that tried to bother one of the sheep, okay? I mean, God don't mess around, okay? But he called one of these, in doing this, he called one beauty and the other bands. Um, in a sense, with, in as much as Christ is the shepherd of shepherds, I see Christ in this. Uh, beauty means grace, okay? And it's through Christ that grace comes. Bands means union. You band it together, okay? You put it together. We're all one in Christ, so it's bound there. So he takes the club, and he takes the staff, breaks them asunder, and we'll read on and see for what purpose. Now, naturally, we're about to approach, even if you would, the crucifixion so that you have from beginning to end a great deal of, of what shall be in this very verse, okay? Verse 8, three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. We didn't get along at all. And probably this is priests and the magistrates and the false prophets. Okay? So I'm going to get rid of them. All in one stroke. Verse 9. Then said I, I will not feed you that, that dieth, let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off, and let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. Let, it, let them destroy each other. Now, again, there comes a time when God says, I love you, I give you the word, now what are you going to do with it? I'm not going to come out there and babysit you. I'm not going to come out there and warm your little bottles of pabulum for you and change your diapers of Christianity. Sooner or later, you've got to mature and be worth something. And when you've been in it enough years that you should be a warrior, if you want to go out there and let them eat you up, that's your business. You should be a tiger out there. You should be a warrior for Almighty God, making that right that is wrong and so forth, making a difference, being salty. You know, when you're salty, you change the flavor of things toward Christ rather than away from him. He said, hey, by then, if you can't make a difference, then, hey, go on out there. Let them eat you up. Let them mislead you. Don't you ever dare do it. You stick with God's word and you be a champion for Almighty God. Don't you let the sheep traffickers uh, hoodwink you claiming to be a shepherd with some staff just simply to sell you off. Verse 10, And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. That was the original covenant with Abraham. When, when he would break the staff, which is to say Christ, and Christ died, and when he resurrected from the dead, we were able to remarry. And have the new covenant, which is to believe upon him, believe the power that he has given us to exercise over our enemies, over God's enemies, to make a difference in this world. 11. And it was broken in that day. 
And so the poor of the flock, that's to say those, those lousy sheep traffickers that waited upon me knew that it was the word of God. When Christ was crucified and resurrected from the dead, the sheep traffickers knew it was of God. Why? They saw the proof of the resurrection. 12. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price. You selling sheep, sell me. What's my price? And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. That's the 30 pieces of silver that Judas threw down in that temple and it ring out into the air. And it was purchased with it. Well, read on, 13. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter, a goodly price that I was praised at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And that 30 pieces of silver out that potter's gate purchased that field as a burying place. We, our bodies are a piece of pottery. That's to say we're earth. Christ, bands in union. When your life is broken, when, when your old pot is broken in so many pieces that it's just shreds, Christ can put it back together for you. He paid the price and got 30 pieces of silver for it that he can heal you. He paid the price. But why? He loves you. He cares about you. So that when no one else could, could help that pile of junk, maybe that's a little distasteful, speaking of our own lives, but maybe, maybe some of us have been there. I don't know. He can put it together better than it was before. A beautiful bow. Beautiful life and give you purpose and destiny. That's why he paid the price. That's why he loves you. And it is for that reason that you should dedicate your lives to pleasing him and serving him so that when you walk into a room, the very presence of the spirit within you makes a difference, makes it salty if necessary where people have direction and purpose and love and understanding of our Father and of His Word. Yes, He bought that potter's field that with His death that He could piece us back together whereby we're whole again in Him. Okay? Verse 13, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter, a goodly price that I was praised at them, and I took the thirty pieces, cast them to the potter in the house. We got that fourteen. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. That's the club, just bam, broke it apart. Fifteen, and the, but it'll be put back together as it's written in Ezekiel thirty-seven. Okay, not to not to worry. And the Lord said unto me. Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. Hey, there's one coming. You haven't seen anything foolish yet until you see the idle shepherd. That's to say the Antichrist. Okay. So I, I'm going to let him come. 16. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that are cut off. Neither shall seek the young one. That actually should be translated the starving one. He didn't care. Nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, that it's so weak it can't even go on. The false Christ doesn't care. Okay. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Uh, he's going to deceive them even to destruction. That's why his name is the destroyer. He loves it. Oh, he can talk sweet. Oh, he can convince most to seduce. But he is the false Messiah. Don't listen to him. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. Your right arm, your right eye, symbolic of your strength. 
His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. We're not going to have to put up with him forever. But you've got to prove yourself that you're not going to be sold. Nobody can buy you. Why? Well, who owns you? Have you ever read Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4? God said, all souls belong to me. They're not for sale. And when you follow him, a lot of people would say, oh, mercy, I'd be getting around to give my soul to God. Too late, friend. He's already got you. Okay. All souls belong to me. I want you to create. He's your father. Okay. So he wants you to please him. He, you know, he wants you, you know, when one of your children succeed and really are outstanding in their field, okay, wherever that may be, you can't help being proud of them, okay? You can't help feeling a love and a satisfaction there. Well, do you think our Father's any different when you say to God, I love you, you are my Father, I want you to use me to your will, Almighty God. That makes his day. It truly does. Isaiah chapter 61. This gets us back to the day of vengeance which Christ spoke of. I'm not going to cover a great deal here, but I do want to cover a little bit. Almighty God says in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is the, song, this is the, um, the uh, script that Jesus picked up and was reading on that day, okay? Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind, unite, to bind, up the brokenhearted, to put the old pieces of pottery back together, to proclaim liberty to the captives, those that will not allow themselves to be held captives. Just in his name I am free, praise God, don't give me a bunch of do-do's this and do-don't-do's that. Okay, I'm free. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound, don't let them bind you, dear one. Anybody that teaches you a Christianity that makes you a second-class citizen is a liar. Okay, straight from Satan's own play. Uh, you're when when you repent and you're forgiven, you have a fresh start. Don't let some man rob you from that. Well, I, I want to teach a Sunday school class. But, well, sister, aren't you a divorcee? Well, I, he was a no good rascal and I had to leave him to save my life. And I've repented to God and he's forgiven me. Can't you, preacher? No. no, no that's a turkey, all right? Any church that makes a second class citizen out of you when you've repented of a sin is no good. There may be some good about them, but they're judgmental. And they don't believe that Christ, in dying on that cross, had the power and the authority to make a new creature out of you or whomever would repent. Okay? And I, I know I get a little strong on that, and I know I get some letters, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, but that's all right with me, you know. Well, well, you must be a divorcee yourself. Lord, yes, 50 times. No, <laughs> no. I, I have never been divorced in my life. But that doesn't change a truth, does it? Of course it doesn't. Don't let some religious organization make a slave out of you or sell your soul. Okay? You belong to Christ. Okay? That's why he came, was to set us free. Verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is where Christ closed the book and put it down. Why? Because that had come to pass. He was born of a virgin. 
to bring salvation to the world. What's, what, if he had continued on, he would not be able to say, today this has come to pass. Because in continuing, in the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Isn't that kind of vengeance of God and comfort to all those that mourn in the same sentence? Of course, because it's our Father and He's always fair. It's the, vengeance belongeth to Him. The great song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 that all overcomers sing. God says, vengeance belongeth to me. And so it does. Um, he, in, in taking his vengeance, comforts those he loves to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified that Christ could be glorified for having reached down and touching you, bringing you up to that place whereby he can use you. The trees of God, the forest of God, the forest that will not wither, as we read in Zechariah chapter 11, a forest that will always be because those plantings are of God and they are people. And they shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. And so it is that, that the nations serve God, the nations that he created. Okay? The word Gentiles is often translated nations, and nations is always often translated Gentiles. God loves the nations. That means he loves all his children. The return of Christ, when all scripture is fulfilled, how's it going to be? What's it going to be like? In closing, New Testament, 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, we're going to take chapter 1. I want to pick it up with verse 7, and I want you to listen real closely as we cover this. I think all of us look forward to that time of his return. That's what the day of vengeance is. but I don't want you to sidetrack yourself whereby you look at only the physical, the armies, national armies, and you're not observing the spiritual armies that in some cases are far more severe because they're lurking to sell your soul, to steal it. How will it be on the day that Christ truly Returns. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Be patient. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He's back, in other words. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you avoid the vengeance of God? By loving him, by believing him. You know, you could stand right in the middle of the fire and it would only be the Holy Spirit that touches your heart and makes you feel good all over your body, where it would burn those that are against God, that disobey him, don't care. It's gonna be a bad day for them. Verse 9, who shall, be, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? I want you to partake of that power. You're not a weakling. You're not a wimp. 
you possess his power. It's Greek dunamis, which we get our word dynamite from. Make a difference. 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. You must believe the Word of God. It's the only truth there is in this world. You will be laughed at, persecuted, made light of. I'm not telling, and never be a religious fanatic because that's what loses your credibility and even drives some people away from the Word of God. Use common sense, exercise it, be salty, bold, make a difference. 11. Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. I think he does. And fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. It's yours, dear one. Don't ever be afraid. Take the power and use it. Twelve that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Can you cut that? Can you handle it? It said, in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made so much, so very much available to us who believe. That makes the difference, my friend. Do you know something? It makes the difference in your life as to whether you're blessed or not. It's to believe upon Him. Hey, you can't outdo God. And He says, I know what you have need of. You do what I ask you to, and I will add these things on to you. I will bless you. Do you know something? You're looking at living proof that that is true. This little old church in northwest Arkansas that has become the largest independent church in the world as far as membership is concerned. With the outreach that God has given us, 320 stations, even in this hemisphere. 320. You know, I don't care what town you go into. Sooner or later, you're going to turn the TV on. Obey God. <laughs> you're going to hear it from the pulpit, all right? Well, God, you know, and you know the beauty of it? We don't have to beg. Oh, dear brother, you should have a telephone. I don't need it. Time is too expensive to beg, teach God's word, and let God bless you. That's the way it works in your private life, beloved. That's why I brought this up. When you hold that line, you make a difference. Where you go, people can sense that you are in him and he is in you. And they're drawn to that many times if they're believers. So be useful to him, love him, follow him. And whatever you do, don't let the sheep traffickers sell you. That's disgusting to be deceived, to be made life light of and laughed at. You're far too great for that. Don't let it happen. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your blessings. Keep us on guard of those powers and warriors from above, Father, that would seek our very souls. Give us the power, the insight, and the knowledge, the wisdom to overcome the enemy, which is to say Satan. In Jesus' precious name, amen.